Well, good evening to the Oaks family and also to our friends of this ministry. And uh, we are here on this uh, evening of April the 15th. Now, on April the 15th, usually for most of us, that uh, kind of symbols a day where uh, we are preparing to either pay our taxes. Uh, for those of us like myself that uh, are considered self-employed under the uh, government's guidelines, we uh, have that be something that we, uh, that's kind of a, a day that usually is a day we're paying taxes, but they've expanded that, extended that because of all that's going on with COVID-19 to being uh, in July. So uh, that should make you happy. Another thing that's a big deal to Barry and Kim of Jude uh, are these precious people, and you can't see them, but inside my Bible is a picture of my family. And uh, it even includes my son-in-law in there, who I call my other son. But the daughter that is here next to the end is named Jordan. And on this evening, whether, I, uh, whether she's tuning in right now or not, or watches it uh, on the recorded version, today is her birthday. And uh, another person that has a birthday today and may be uh, watching this evening uh, is Connie Bozier. And Connie uh, uh, had a birthday today as well, so we wish her a very happy birthday. And uh, anyway, we won't tell the ages of these ladies, you know how that, that kind of thing is. But what we will do tonight is take you to a passage of Scripture. We've been talking about big problems, bigger God. Big problems, bigger God. And that's what this series is called, and we're taking a little tour through the Psalms. And tonight, I'm going to take you to one of my favorite Psalms. It's Psalm 37. And Psalm 37 is a Psalm that talks about the subject of worry. In fact, it has so many delightful passages in it. We're going to share those tonight, and we're going to give you some principles to really live your life by that with all the uncertainty of our time, with all that's unprecedented in our lives, having to, uh, to be uh, sheltering at home, working at home, so many unemployed, just uh, I, I keep hearing every day about someone else in the life of our church, somebody else I know uh, in the community that uh, is without a job. But tonight I want you to do something. Join me, if you will, in the book of Psalms, chapter 37. And I want to take you there and have some time of Bible study tonight. Again, I want to encourage you that as we get closer to the end of the Bible study tonight, that you would do something with me, and that is simply this. If you have a prayer need, or you know somebody that needs prayer, and sometimes you may not even need to share their, their names. Maybe you just say their first name, especially since it's going to be in the feed on this live uh, streaming that we have right now. But go with me to Psalm 37, and I want to take you there, and let's have prayer as we begin our evening. Father, we do pray that your Holy Spirit would guide the conversation that I lead in tonight. And I pray that, Father, I would be totally submissive to saying only that which is pleasing to you. Father, people are worried, and we pray that they would realize tonight that they don't need to be. They need to look to you, lean on you, and, Father, you're going to give us some biblical instruction that if we're prone to worry, how to defeat this in our lives. So, Father, we're going to talk about living a, worried, a worry-free life and help us to do that. And, Father, there's some folks right now that are listening to this prayer, joining in this prayer, that that's a bigger struggle for them than it is for other people that are listening. So, Father, those that especially struggle with that, help them tonight to be able to have victory in this area. And, Lord, we ask that you'll bless our time Lord, there's just so many needs. We pray for our president. We pray for Vice President Pence that is heading up the team against COVID-19 and working so diligently. Every day we're hearing reports from them of all that's going on. 
So we pray that you would give healing. And Father, we ask that what you would do in this time that we have tonight is that you would take your word and, Lord, plant it deep into our hearts. You've told us that it will never return void and that it will speak to us. In fact, the word of God has the power to change us. So, Father, change hearts, change lives from being worried to living a worry-free life. And we ask this in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, we're glad you've joined us tonight, and uh, if you're a guest, we're especially glad that you've tuned in, and whether you catch this live right now from 6.30 to 7.30 on Wednesday nights, or you catch it in its recorded version, we are just glad that you're uh, checking it out, getting into the Word, spending some time in prayer, and we will be doing that this evening. You know, worry has been defined and I want you to hear this. You may even want to write it down. If you got the email blitz today, then this is actually an outline that's on there. And uh, if you haven't run that out already, if you have a computer that you can still run that out, go do that and uh, use that to kind of fill in some blanks as we go along this evening. But worry's been defined as a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. And that's a good description. It really is a good description. I want you to hear that again. A, that worry is defined as a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Think about that. If all thoughts are drained, then it, it, it leads us to a place of being nonproductive in our lives. Uh, it leads us to thinking about the struggles and worries of our life, and uh, it really is uh, problematic. Someone has said that, ulc that ulcers are caused not by what you eat, but what is eating you. Worry has also been described as a rocking chair. It gives you an activity, but you never get anywhere, do you? You just keep rocking back and forth. No real productivity except maybe a little bit of exercise, not much. Well, Jesus said something, and I want you to join me there. We're going to be in the book of Matthew for a few moments, and I want you to look at a passage that's found in the book of Matthew, and it's found in chapter 6. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And in that passage, I'm going to share with you verse 25, verse 27, and then I'm going to jump all the way down to almost uh, right at the end of the chapter in verse, 20, uh, verse 34. And here's what's said there. It's really interesting to look at this, and here's what's said. Jesus tells us, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Listen to the stuff he brings up. What you will eat, or drink, or what, uh, or about your body, or what you should wear. When, uh, who of you by worrying can add one single hour to his life? And then he comes down at the end of that great chapter and he says, therefore do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Have you not found that to be the, the, uh, just the, the truth in your own life? That every day there's going to be enough struggles and issues to, to really deal with that? I want to share a couple other things with you too. Charles Mayo uh, made the statement, and uh, of course the Mayo Clinics, he was so tied to the Mayo Clinics that have emerged around the country, and of course we... We lived fairly close to the one in Cleveland. Uh, what a massive uh, healing place that is of that hospital chain. I've, I don't know how many buildings, probably 25, 30, I don't know. It's just a gigantic uh, medical center. And I know there's a few of those around the country as well. But he said this about worry. He said, worry affects the circulation. It affects our heart. It affects the glands and the entire or whole nervous system. I want you to hear that again. He said that 
Worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system. Now that's not a positive effect that he's talking about. He's talking about the negative effect that worry has. That worry will produce difficulties with your heart, difficulties with your glands, difficulty with circulation, difficulty with the whole nervous system. And said that many, many years ago, but it's still true. Oswald Chambers, this, that great spiritual giant that gave us some great writings, he said this, all worry is caused by calculating without God. Did you hear that? All worry is, is uh, created, caused by calculating without God. I want you to think about that tonight. How many times do you not pray about something? How many times do you just talk to somebody else about it? You get their counsel, their feedback. Maybe even you, you talk to five different people. And God wants us to perpetually use his truth to guide our lives, and he wants us to come to him with all things. We should pray, not just in the morning, not just in the evening, not just in the middle of the day. We should pray as we go throughout our day. And that'll help you focus on that. But Oswald Chambers, I want to focus the rest of what we're saying on what he said. All worry is caused by calculating without God. So think about that tonight. If all worry that's in my life is created, caused, by me calculating without God, then obviously I've got to flip that around and I've got to come to a place that all my calculations, all of my formulas, all of my recipes, ladies, all the things that I do, Everything that I put together, everything that I order in my life has to be that I have included God in my calculations. And without him, I will come to the place that I may be perpetually haunted by worry. So today I want to talk to you because what David experienced is that he was uh, struggling with fretting. He uses the word fret. F-R-E-T. We don't use that all the time, but it's another word for worry. In fact, I want to read to you some of the scripture that he shares, but David gives us something that's wonderful. He was fighting a fretful attitude of worry. And in Psalm 37, God gave David four principles. Four principles. So I want to ask that you look at these principles tonight in scripture. If you have a Bible, get that Bible laying out. If you don't have a Bible that's a paper copy of the Bible, then use your phone. And if you're using the phone to watch this, then obviously if you've got a tablet or something. But take some notes. And uh, as we said, we've got that handout for you that you can join in. But God gives David four principles. Now in these four principles, here's what he says. And the first principle is here. <coughs> and he says that if you struggle with worry, and I do believe everybody does to a degree, I believe some people struggle in huge ways with worry. But if you struggle with worry, here's what he says, principle number one. Here's what he tells us to do. The very first thing he says is he says, rely on the Lord. Rely on the Lord. And you say, well, I, I professed Christ as my Lord and Savior. I gave myself to Jesus, and I do rely upon the Lord. Well, the proof's in the pudding. Let me share with you what we're talking about. If you're relying on the Lord, there's some things that are just going to be true about your life. Relying on the Lord looks like this. Look at the passage, and he says some things. And I want you to look at what uh, we'll share from this passage tonight. But he starts in verse one by saying in chapter 37 of Psalms, if you uh, didn't hear that part earlier on, he says, do not fret because of evil men. Well, instead of talking about evil men tonight, let's talk about evil sickness, or let's talk about evil disease or evil virus, because it still would apply to the truth of this scripture. You see, all sickness, all disease, even death came as a result of sin, didn't it? 
The Bible tells us crystal, in a crystal clear fashion that everything that we're enduring that was not part of the original design that God gave for Adam and Eve to live in, all of that has come as part of the fall, man choosing to sin. And in this passage, he says, do not fret because of evil men. So instead of saying evil men tonight, we're going to say evil disease, evil virus like COVID-19. It's here because of the sin factor. But listen to this. Don't fret because of COVID-19. Or be envious of those who do wrong, he says. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. David was struggling with what he was seeing with his eyes. I don't know about you, but you may be struggling seeing what you're seeing right now. You're watching the news, and the news can be very, very discouraging right now, can it? Why is it so discouraging? Well, I know uh, on uh, one of the channels that I watch uh, most frequently, a lot of times they'll have the COVID-19 stats in the column right there on the side. If it's not on the side, it may be running uh, as a bullet on the bottom of the page. And it'll remind you of how many people have been infected uh, with the virus. And I believe it's now just crossed two million people. Uh, it was right at that, right before we came on tonight. So uh, that's mind boggling to think that this thing has spread in a few months around the globe and two million people are infected. It's depressing to see that, isn't it? It's discouraging. It is worrisome. It's a burden. It makes us fret. But listen to this. He says that just like plants and just like uh, grass, it grows up and then there's a season that it has and it dies. Let me tell you something about COVID-19. We keep hearing them tell us this, but there will be a vaccine someday. They are going to discover drugs that do help, and we keep hearing about possibilities. It is going to come to a place of change, and it will end. And I want to remind you of that. In Psalm 37, David was struggling with the things that he outwardly saw. You might be struggling too. So I want you to see something with me. Go to Psalm 37, and the first phrase was what? Do not what? Fret. Do not fret. And then in verse 8, that advice is repeated. Now remember, David is sharing his heart. But God is meeting him at his point of honest need, and God gives him solutions. That's what the Word of God, especially the book of Psalms, is all about. So he tells him in chapter 37, starts with this, verse 1, do not fret. And then in verse 8, it's repeated because listen to what it says there. Do not fret, it only causes harm. So when I get all anxious and I just don't know what to do with myself and I look at the environment and I look at the circumstances and I get my eyes fixed on all the things that are going on around me, it can mess me up. I'm just talking about you being messed up. You see, I need to be guided. I need to be controlled. I need to have God instructing me and so do you. You need God's Spirit to guide your life, not by looking at all the things that surround you and being filled with anxiety and anxiousness and fretting, worrying over those things. You need to come to a place where you allow God to guide you, even though those things are all around you. He can guide you on a straight path that He speaks about, and He can take you down that walk and walk with you as indwelling you by the power of his Holy Spirit. They didn't have that advantage in the Old Testament in this psalm. But God can guide you, walk with you. He can give you truth. And in that truth, you rest. In that truth, you rely. In that truth, you're able to stand. And in that truth, you can even be calm when the world is in chaos all around you. It's so important. You live life in that reality. Here's how we get rid of worry. He tells us, do not fret. And as it said in verse, that eighth verse, do not fret because it only does what? 
it only causes harm. You've got to realize that it's harmful to your being. It's harmful to your soul, to your spirit. It's harmful to your physical body even, to be fretful, worrying, and to live in that state. Some medical reports, even those that have no ties to religion whatsoever, any ties to Christianity, they have shared that they believe maybe 60 to 70 to 80, some results as high as 80% of illnesses can be tied to anxiousness and not being able to rest properly. Listen to this. The English word that is fret, and that's what we're using today with our English languages we shared tonight, it comes from an old English word called fretten. Fretten means to be to devour, to eat, to gnaw into something. And then David uses a Hebrew word here, which is the Hebrew word chara. And chara, and I believe these are coming up for you right here, chara has its root idea that it's growing warm, it's blazing up. Um, it's tied very much to the concept of the idea of worrying or to burn. Now, I don't know if you've heard this through the years, I sure have, that if people worry, they're going to, uh, they're going to cause their, their digestive system to become uneasy. Uh, there may be uh, heartburn, there may be stomach issues, there may be digestive issues. And this is exactly what's being spoken about here. If you put those two pictures together, think of worry as a rat. I mean a nasty rat. And I can remember when we had uh, a rat problem when we lived in Florida. We were living on the Space Coast, and man, there was, I went in the garage one night, and above the garage, uh, it was open. It was an open area. We were living in the parsonage uh, or the pastorium, whichever your word preference, that the church had there that I pastored. And uh, I walked in there, and man, I watched this rat. I mean, a large rat. Uh, I first thought it was some other animal, like a raccoon. That's how big it was. But it was very long. Its body probably uh, like this size. And of course, they have that long skinny tail. And he literally grabbed a wire and ran up into uh, the area up above our house. Well, soon as my wife heard about that, I had one mission in life. I didn't have any other missions. Uh, everything else was tabled until that rat was gone. Uh, our washer and dryer were out there in that, that area of the garage. And uh, so we got some rat traps and poison and so forth, and we eventually killed that rat. Well, think about worry like it's a rat. And in terms of thinking about that, think of it like this. It's a rat inside your soul. It's gnawing away at you. Think of Satan as being an arsonist. And he is setting your soul, your being, on fire. Well, that's what worry is like, is when you feel out of control. You really do. King David is saying something to us. If you go all the way down to verse 25, which we're not going to cover that part, but King David is saying, I have been young, and now I am old. And he says, I know the Lord takes care of us. So he's coming down and he's saying, I've seen many things. I've suffered many burdens. I've learned many lessons. And based on a lifetime of experience, my, my advice to you is simply this. Kill off the rats and put out the fires. What rats? The rats of worry. Put out the fire of worry. Back to the original meaning of this word. Don't fret. It only causes harm. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said something I want you to hear tonight. And here's what he said. He said to fret is to worry. To have the heart burn. To fume. To become vexed. I don't want to be vexed. I know you don't want to be vexed, do you? Well, he tells us that that's exactly what's taking place when we get into this type of state. Second of all, notice this. 
he tells us that we've got to rely upon the Lord. And you'll notice in this study tonight, he says don't rely on sight, but rely upon the Lord. Rely upon the Lord. In verse 3, an amazing verse. He says, trust in the Lord and do good. Listen to the benefit of that. Trust in the Lord and do what? Do good. Live the right kind of life. Be a moral person. Have a righteousness about the way you choose to live your life. And then he says this. He says, and you will dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Well, what's being stated there is this. I'm going to enjoy my life in the land, and I'm going to have safety as part of that mix of my life. All the things that we're saying, I notice that many of us are greeting each other or we are saying goodbye to each other, uh, whether it's a telephone call or an email or something on social media, and we'll say, be safe. Well, we all know what we're talking about. We're talking about being safe from the virus, aren't we? We're talking about being safe from this foe that has entered our lives and has rearranged our lives. I uh, am speaking tonight not to a room. I'm in our sanctuary that we call Looper Hall at the Oaks Church, and I am speaking to, there are only just a few people in here helping to run the ministry so we can bring you this stream and bring you the recording. There are no people here, so to speak. It's just empty chairs. It's a strange thing to teach. I'm just trying to focus on the few in here and uh, speak to them tonight. But he says, trust in the Lord and do good. What will happen as a result? You'll dwell in the land and you'll enjoy safe pasture. In other words, there's going to be blessings and benefits to trusting the Lord. He tells you there will be safe pasture. It's the word trust here that it's the Hebrew word aman. And aman carries the idea to support or affirm. It's kind of like when you hear people say amen tied to the same. It's agreement. It's support. I agree. Amen. That's the word here, aman that is being used for trust uh, at its very root. We often live life like the man who lived uh, and had uh, up on a hillside, and man, he had gone to a place that he'd been to many times, but there had been some of the edge fall away on this cliff. He was trying to check it out, and he himself fell over the cliff and literally grabbed some roots from a tree that were just above his head up on the, on the uh, top of the cliff. And he's hanging there, and he starts to yell, Is anybody up there? And a voice comes back, Yes, I'm here. The man responds, Help me. He said, Who is this? He said, It's the Lord. I will help you. The man says, Help me. Help me right now. And the Lord says, let go of the branch. There was some silence. He said, what? Let go of the branch. And the man says, is anybody else up there? Well, we operate like that sometimes. We lean on the Lord, we profess Him, but when we really ought to be leaning on Him, we ought to be trusting Him fully, sometimes we fail Him in that, that uh, moment, don't we? And it can be that you may be struggling with that right now as we're going through this epidemic, this pandemic that we're facing with COVID-19. It's just got you just totally... I talk to people almost every day that someone tells me they're struggling. They're just struggling. Oftentimes, these are Christian people, and they're struggling. Life is so different right now, and it sure is. It's real different to do church right now. But hey, we still are sharing God's Word, and we're coming and giving it, and we are so thankful that we started streaming about a year ago so that we can continue to do that. Look at this. John R. Rice who I don't quote him often, but he said something really good about worry. Worry is putting question marks where God puts periods. 
Worry is putting question marks where God puts periods. And you know that's absolutely the truth. Look at this second principle, and that is this. He tells us that we need to rejoice in the Lord. What was the first thing that we talked about we needed to do? We needed to do what? We need to rely on the Lord. And that is clearly what verse 3 tells us, that we need to trust the Lord, trust in Him. And then we come down to this second principle, and he says, rejoice in the Lord. Now here it is, rejoice in the Lord. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is the verse I'm getting ready to read. It's verse 4. And it says, it gives us a principle of the Lord here. And the rest of these, I'm going to share that as sub points in this Bible study tonight, that these will be principles of the Lord, and then we'll talk about a promise of the Lord in each of these sections. But he says this principle of the Lord is this, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Did you hear that? Did you hear what God said to you? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll do what? He'll give you the desires of your heart. Wow. Does that, does that sound like some kind of card blanc uh, statement? Card blanche? I want to tell you what that really does mean. It's important that you understand the meaning so that you don't think that this is a name it and claim it kind of verse. Listen to this. The Hebrew word that's here in this passage for delight, and you need to understand what delight is. You really do to properly understand this verse. It's the Hebrew word tava. And tava in the Hebrew text has something that's really interesting. And uh, it's pulled up here on the screen for you. Tava means that a desire for or extremely joyful over. So this would be like you're in a love relationship and you're crazy about somebody. It's that type of delight when we say, use the word delight. That's why he says, delight yourself in the Lord. Here's the principle. We need to delight ourselves in the Lord. And then he gives us this wonderful promise. Now, at the former church I pastored, there was this lady that was in our church. And she and her husband had come out of... Uh, I believe, if I remember right, an Assembly of God background. Well, she was an extremely expressive lady. If I ever asked a, a rhetorical question, she answered it out loud. Every time she heard something that moved her, she'd shout. She would say amen. Her name was Sarah. And I want to tell you something. That lady had been through things in her life. She had suffered from a stroke, and it had caused some paralysis that she never fully uh, recovered from, and it affected her voice. But as she said, I don't talk funny, I just talk different. But I would be preaching along, and she'd just shout. And I mean to tell you, it, it, I had to kind of adjust a little bit, but I loved her and her dear husband so very much, still do. So thankful for them. There was such a rejoicing spirit in her. She delighted in the Lord. And uh, we all knew it because we'd hear her testimony all the time. Listen to this. Spurgeon said something I want you to catch here. You see, there's a promise from the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will do what? He will give you what? The desires of your heart. Now, Spurgeon said something, I think this is the proper interpretation. Spurgeon said, I already quoted Spurgeon once, but I'm going to borrow from him twice. And here's what he says in this passage. Men who delight in God desire or ask for nothing but what pleases God. Hence, it is safe for them to have carte blanche. Did you hear that? Let me read it again. Spurgeon said... Men who delight themselves, we could put women in there as well, women who delight themselves, men and women who delight themselves, people who delight themselves in God, and, and uh, who delight in God desire or ask for nothing but what pleases God. Hence, it is safe for them to have carte blanche. Did you understand that? I want to tell you something. That is key to understanding this passage. You see... 
Never in Scripture do I become a dictator to God. I've had people that say, well, you just have to have faith. You speak it. You believe it. You, it's yours. You can claim it. It's not quite like that. You see, the Scriptures bear record to several things. We have to ask according to His will, as 1 John chapter 5 tells us. The Scriptures tell us that if we abide in Him and His Word abides in us, John chapter 15, then we can ask whatever we will and it will be done or given to us. Again, much like this passage, if you're really walking with God, your desires, your heart is going to become and match God, like David is spoken of in the Old Testament, of having a heart after God. It's important to understand that because it's not a name it, claim it verse. It is a verse that says, if you will delight in the Lord, you will have your heart match God, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That's exactly what he's saying. Third, there's a principle here that we need to relinquish to the Lord. Relinquish to the Lord. And he says this principle of the Lord is found in verse 5, and it's also found in verse 6. Listen to this. He says in this passage these words, Commit your ways to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. Well, what we're all wanting to know now is what is this? What is He going to do for us? If we commit our ways to the Lord, we trust in Him, God says He will do this. So again, we have this principle that if we commit our ways to God, not just our thinking, but now we're talking about committing your everyday life, every part of your life, committing that to the Lord. Here's what he says, commit your ways unto him, to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. Billy Graham said this about anxiety. I want you to hear this. He said that anxiety is a natural result when our hopes are centered on anything short of God and his will for us. Did you hear that? I have to have my mind set on God and His will. Anxiety will be the result of not doing that. So listen to what this promise says. What did the passage say? Verse 5, we left it incomplete. Commit your ways to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. Fill it in. Verse 6, let's go there. He will make your righteousness, it says, shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Wouldn't you like to have that type of anointing, that type of blessing on your life? That you are going to have a life that beams for God. People will take notice of your life. They will see that you shine. And that the shining is not just your personality. It's not just your education. It's not your, your ingenuity or your sense of, uh, of, of knowledge and experience that you've collected. All those things make up who we are. But what they'll notice about you is the same thing they noticed about Jesus uh, when they noticed that some of his disciples were unschooled uh, people. They weren't impressive people. They weren't highly educated. They weren't impressive folks. And they took note of this in Acts chapter 4, that these men had been with Jesus. That's the most notable thing I can tell you for sure. I promise you the most notable thing you'll find in my life is that I encountered Jesus Christ when I was 15 years old and that I have been trying to follow him since then. It's the only notable thing that's really there. Your righteousness will shine like the what? Like the dawn. Like the beginning of a brilliant day. Have you ever gotten up and you're just up that, at that time of day when the sun is rising and you see that sun start to emerge as, it, as the earth rotates and you see that brilliant sunshine? It's a powerful reminder of the Lord, but he says you'll shine like that, that you're coming into somebody's life, coming into somebody's experience, talking with them, and you'll be able to shine like that for Christ in their life. He says that your cause will be like the noonday sun. Well, what's true of a noonday sun? The noonday sun is not now in the east or the west in our perspective of our rotating planet, but where is it? It's right up above us. 
right? It's straight up above us as a noonday sun, that you're brightening the day and all the lives of those around you. Isn't that an incredible statement? He says that if you will literally relinquish to the Lord, commit your ways to the Lord, trust him, he will do this. What will he do? He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. I want to take you to a final principle, and that is this, principle number four. Principle number four, and here it is. That principle is simply that you need to rest in the Lord. You need to rest in the Lord. You know why you need to rest in the Lord? Because to not rest in the Lord leaves us in a place of unrest. You follow me? It is terrible to not be able to rest. If you've been there and you've struggled with that, and I know insomnia can be caused by many things, uh, having trouble sleeping. I've had my own share of that at times. I've had times I believe God woke me up in the middle of the night to, to go and pray. And there's been times I went room to room when my children were small and I prayed. In fact, one of the times I remember one of them woke up and said, Dad, what are you doing? And I, <laughs> it's two or three o'clock in the morning. I'm standing over their bed praying over them. And uh, listen, I'm sure that was a little freaky to a kid. He gives us this principle from the Lord. Here it is in verse 7. Be still. Be still. Have you ever been injured when you were a child and your mom or your dad said, be still? Because you're squirming. You got a place that's hurt on your elbow or your arm or you got a cut on your hand and you're squirming, and they're trying to clean it up, and maybe even what they put on it burns a little bit, right? And they're telling you to be still. What God tells us as his children, be still. Listen to this. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. All of us need to be still right now. We need to be patiently waiting on the Lord. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways or when a disease or a virus continues to spread. Listen to this. When they carry out their wicked schemes, when this disease continues to take lives from us, it continues to make people ill, and all people, I, I think, that have dealt with this, uh, thank God there's so many now, way up over 300,000 that have fully recovered, and it just keeps growing every day. We need to be still. God wants us to be still. We're his kids. And he can minister to us most effectively when we are. I want you to see something else. And here's the promise. It starts in verse 7. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways or when a disease is spreading like COVID-19, which carry out their wicked schemes. Listen to verse 8. Refrain from anger. Have you ever gotten mad because of the situation and the environment that's around you and your family? Maybe you're a single person and just people you care about because of all the circumstances that are around you, it just makes you angry. You're like, why is it like this? And I want to tell you something. Listen to the rest of this. He says, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Listen again. Do not fret. It leads only to what? To evil. And then the rest of the passage goes on to tell us about evil men. And, of course, we're applying this to an evil disease tonight, right? And all the way up to verse 11, he talks about that. And he says, but the meek will inherit the land and will enjoy great peace. Those that will be controlled, guided, walked with God through this mess, they will have peace. And as he says at the end of that passage, he tells us, they will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. We've been praying that there would not be a single person as part of our church family that's lost to this disease. I'm trusting God for that. I believe him for that. Uh, I know if it, uh, I want to share with you this, tranquility, and when we think about tranquility, we, we think about peace, don't we? We think about things being like we want them to be, and 
being able to be peaceful. Well, God tells us, I give you the ability that when things are not peaceful and you don't have what you want, I have given you the, the ability to rise above that and have the peace of God which passes. It surpasses all understanding. I can't figure this out. I don't know what it all means, but I am at peace in the midst of of all that's going on and all the change that we have in our lives. Listen to this. John Wesley said, as he walked with the Lord for many years, he says, I have gotten to a place in my life that I could no more worry than I could curse or swear. I gave up cursing and swearing when I was very young. And I've gotten to a place that I just can't worry. I've learned to trust God. I don't think that's an arrogant statement. A few days ago, in fact, it was a couple weeks ago, I shared with you something, and I've had several people that said they didn't catch all that, and would I share it again? And tonight, I end our study by talking about uh, South African pastor uh, Andrew Murray, who had a very terrible crisis, horrible crisis in his life, and he went to prayer, and he said that in his prayer and in his journal, God reminded him of some things. I thought, boy, this is even more applicable to tonight's study than it was to the one I shared it a few weeks ago. But I want to remind you of what he said because it really does, really does matter. Here's what he said. He said, I have come to this and God's given me peace. As I write down in my journal these words. First, he brought me here. It is by his will that I am in this straight place in that fact I will rest I will rest listen to his second thing he said next he will keep me here in his love and give me the grace to behave as his child I don't have to get all messed up and all worried and all anxious and I can't be still I can be still and rest in him why because he's going to keep me in his love and in his grace. And he's going to help me behave as his child because the Spirit helps us do that. Third of all, he says, then he will make the trial a blessing, teaching me the lessons he intends for me to learn, working in me the grace that he means for me to bestow. Last, in his good time, he can bring me out again and how and when He knows. So then he wrote down these four conclusions. He said, so let me say this. Right now, right here. By God's appointment, I'm here. In his timing, I'm here. Under his training, I'm here. For his time, I'm here. Hear those again. He said and concluded, let me say, I am here by God's appointment in his keeping, under his training, and what was last? For his time. We're on God's timetable. And listen, there are so many people tuning in to to programs, streamings, recordings like this. In fact, there are some telling us that it is at record high numbers. One of the major search words in Google right now is God and Jesus and having a relationship with God. Isn't that amazing? It's important for us to hear that. Well, we're going to close with prayer tonight. And I want to ask, as we just have our prayer time come up, and just ask you, please share prayer needs. We're going to just pray over those needs. Now, We are a little bit delayed behind you, so we won't see these just as quickly as you put them up. But if you would do this for us, we would love for you to just start putting prayer concerns that you have, maybe people you want to pray for. If you would put those on the, uh, just, just type them in there as you're listening. We've got about eight minutes before we wrap up and have, we'll be closing with prayer. But if you are, uh, there's a prayer need you'd like to share, you are more than welcome to just uh, type that in right now. Just hit your keyboard, or if you're on your phone. 
and share those with us. I'll share this with you as we're waiting for some to come in. Um, I found out on a news report on Sunday morning before we had church that the suicide hotline, I want you to hear this, this is incredible. I mean, it's so heart-wrenching. You know people are wondering what's going on. They're having a difficult time dealing with everything. The suicide hotline for online contacts and phone calls in the United States is up 835%. 835%. Obviously, while we're waiting for some prayer concerns to come in, we need to have prayer for folks that uh, are leading our nation. We need to pray for President Trump, his cabinet. We need to pray for Vice President Pence and the team that's working on the uh, COVID-19 virus and combating that. Uh, now we've got some prayer needs that are up here. Let me share with you. Here's one from uh, Christina that uh, just a best friend of hers uh, sharing that uh, Linda's pregnant in Alaska. So she's praying, asking that we join her for safety and peace for her and her family. So we also have uh, uh, Julie that is sharing, uh, praying for Marion, a co co-worker who lost her husband to COVID-19. We're going to hear more and more of those stories, so let's listen to that. We have uh, uh, Glenda that is sharing about a sibling uh, her nurse sister that is in St. Louis, and also uh, Bill that's in Tulsa, uh, Jobs, and boy, do we need to pray over Jobs. We are in our own family. We've had a couple of our kids lose their jobs. Uh, we've got uh, Seal uh, in California who is not a believer yet that they want, are asking for prayer. Uh, Roberta is uh, typed in to pray for my family uh, for Tiffany and Christine so we want to pray for them uh, we know that one young lady quite well around here uh, we also want to pray uh, Tiffany is uh, writing in a prayer concern that my boss's son who uh, has volunteered in the army to report early to join in the fight against COVID-19 isn't that honorable that uh, they're doing just that. So I want to share that need and pray over that. You may be seeing these in your column as you're watching and these as well. Others, you're sure welcome to join. We've got a couple more minutes that will take prayer concerns. Uh, we want to pray for everybody we can. We've got a long, long list here at our church, and uh, we want to continue to, to pray and see those answered. Uh, Roger is asking that we pray for Jimmy, who's having surgery today and recovering, and his recovery. So we want to pray for Jimmy today and ask that God would really bless and meet him at his point of need. Uh, are there others to share? Please feel so free. You don't even have to share a name. God knows who they are if you're concerned about that. Just type down a general uh, information and we'll join you in prayer. And you may have some in your own life that you'd like to share. Others need prayer this evening. Others. All right, we'll wait just a moment more. But if any others need prayers this evening, we would sure welcome uh, praying. Listen, one of the most powerful things we do at the Church of Jesus Christ is we pray for people. God hears, God answers prayer. And I believe that with all my heart. I've seen him do that which is just, there's no category except saying it's miraculous. It's a miracle. And we need to pray for folks tonight. And we encourage you to just join us and share those. All right, we've got a couple other prayer needs for Bob from Donna. So we're going to lift up Bonna, uh, Bob. God knows who he is, she says. Uh, Mary is sharing pray for our faith class. And then mentions Jean, Phyllis, Tessie, Joyce, Ruth, Barbara, Mary, M Muriel, 
and uh, all the folks that have lost jobs. Well, we are just a couple minutes to closing this time of streaming, so I'm just going to go to prayer. And best as I can remember these, I'm going to pray. In fact, I'll go over them again before I go to bed tonight, and I will pray for every single one that you've listed. We may have had some that were up there early tonight, but we want to stop and have prayer together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, how you tell us not to fret, not to worry. And Lord, I hope tonight this study has helped some people with that struggle. Lord, I pray that you'd give them victory over worry. Help them to rely upon you, to relinquish to you, to rest in you. And Father, I pray that you would give them victory. Every request that has been shared here that we have read off and maybe some I haven't seen from earlier posts. We pray that you would meet them at their point of need. Lord, especially these that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior yet. Save them. Reveal to them who Jesus is. Show him. May your spirit draw them unto Christ that they would know the forgiveness of sin. They would know eternal life and a better life here. Lord, for those that are struggling uh, as someone had lost a family member to COVID-19. We just pray over that need. We pray for many who have lost their jobs. Lord, last, just in the last couple of weeks, 17 million have applied for unemployment. That's a tenth of our workforce in the United States. So Lord, we pray for them. And I just pray that people can find work, we thank you that we're hearing the report that our government, in their gracious response, Lord, that people are starting to receive checks to help them get by. And Lord, we pray that uh, these could get unemployment. We pray that more than that, that you'd give them a new job. Lord, it may be a different job. It may be a job for a season just to help pay bills and so forth. I thank you for the supply, the, the uh, generous giving of our people have, that have continued to keep the church going in these days. And Father, uh, I just pray that you'll continue to enable all the churches that are out there to continue to minister and keep their staff, keep doing all the things they're doing. We're just having to do it in different ways. Father, I pray that you be glorified in our Christian lives. May we be a witness to the community. May they not see us fretting. May they not see us worrying but may they see us being rock steady. And Lord, that we are walking and relying upon the Lord. We're resting in you. And I pray that they would witness that in our lives. Father, we want to pray for these other needs, and we simply ask that you'll bless this night. Lord, just bless everyone that's joined us. I pray that you'll strengthen them with that inner spirit, and they'll have the desire with their heart to be fully committed to you. And Lord, beat this thing of worry. Give them, give them a worry-free life. Give them that victory. And Lord, we pray that a vaccine and healing is coming soon. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are the Oaks. And we are here in Grand Prairie, Texas. We are so thankful for you joining us this evening. I want to encourage you, if you made a decision in one of these services that we have that you let us know, we're located at 801 East I-20, Grand Prairie, Texas, 75052. Write us a note. Write in the column, and I'll get back to you. You don't even have to share any personal information. Just say, I'd like to pray with someone. I'd like to talk with someone. We'll try to help you with that. We have several on our staff that, that do that very thing. <clears throat> God bless you. Live a worry-free life. Love you in the Lord. Good night.